Hello, and welcome to your IMCAT Summer Institute. I'm Clay Avery. We hope you're all having a wonderful summer. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be joined here by Janet Warren from TEA's Instructional Materials Division. Uh, she's here today to answer some common questions that TEA gets uh, and addresses with respect to instructional materials. And uh, really, without any further ado, we're going to jump right into this and uh, kick off with the first question. So, Janet, what questions take up most of the TEA Instructional Materials Division's time? Well, mostly we get questions about how to order. So we spend a lot of our time walking districts through the ordering process, both for requisitions and disbursement requests. We also get a lot of questions about returning materials to the STRC, the Special Textbook Redistribution Center. Um, that is open from November to March each year, and I know a lot of districts are really wanting to use the summer to clean out their warehouses, but that's also the time when the STRC is getting new materials out to districts ordering for the new school year. So that will not be open. You'll need to hold on to those materials until November. Excellent. Uh, so let's go to what are the guidelines for allotment reimbursement for technology? So there's a lot of things that can be purchased through the IMA for technology. Um, it's very broad, but it needs to be something that's going to provide instruction for students. So something like a student information system isn't providing access to instructional materials and isn't providing instruction to students, it's just housing data. So that would not be an allowable expense. Uh, but anything such as e uh, technology equipment, uh, learning management systems that are providing access to instructional materials, those things would be allowable. And for a technological equipment request, you need to be um, mindful of putting everything in the correct category. So you'll, if you look at the slide, you can see that you need to add categories by clicking on the plus sign next to the disbursement category to add additional categories. So if you were to purchase, let's say, laptops and um, a charging cart and Chrome management licenses, then you would need two different categories, a laptop category and an equipment support category for the Chrome management licenses and the laptop charging cart. Excellent. Um, let's go into this next question. I know it's one that, that can get pretty detailed. So what are the guidelines for using allotment funds to pay for technology-related salaries? Okay, so we have several slides on this. Um, salary, uh, the allotment uh, can be used to pay the salary and other expenses of an employee who provides technical support for the use of technological equipment directly involved in student learning. You notice that's underlined. That's the key here. You're going to submit this three different times per year at the end of November for September, October, and November, at the end of February for December, January, and February, and at the end of May or the end of the contract for the remaining months. Um, it's going to always be a reimbursement to the district's payroll, so future dates should never be included. And you need to include the dates of service in your request. Um, I have some examples of some allowable salary disbursement requests. Uh, one would be an employee who provides technical support for the learning management system used to provide access to instructional materials. Another example that's allowable would be an employee who provides support through planning and professional development for teachers and staff to integrate technology into the classroom. Um, another allowable example would be a computer lab technician who, do work, who works directly with the students. And an employee who performs maintenance and provides technical support for technological equipment used in labs or classrooms. Uh, there are a few examples of non-allowable salary disbursement requests, which would be a classroom teacher's salary, a stipend for a teacher or a staff member, a testing coordinator's salary, or the instructional materials coordinator's salary. Okay. So let's talk about um, a, a little bit of an unpleasant topic. What is the most commonly requested item in a disbursement that is denied? 
Uh, our most common request that we deny would be um, an inventory management system um, because that's not providing access to instructional materials. Um, we do reopen requests frequently for learning management systems because a learning management system can be requested for the portion that provides access to instructional materials and many times we'll need to reopen that for districts to adjust um, that request to only allow for the portion that's providing access to instructional materials. Uh, a gradebook, for example, does not provide access to instructional materials, so that would need to be removed from that total request amount. Excellent. So, um, in ter terms of categorize, categorizing items, uh, what's the most mo mi commonly miscategorized? That's a hard word to say. Miscategorized <laughs> item in a disbursement request. So, site licenses for um, digital instructional materials should be on an instructional materials request, such as a, let's say, a license for iStation. Um, but many times those are entered as contracted services, so we'll have to reopen those uh, requests and ask a district to move it to a, a instructional materials request. Uh, professional development also is been, has been included on several instructional materials requests, and that should be in a technological services or technology services request with professional development as the category. And when we talk about professional development, it needs to make sure that it is a professional development that is um, tied to an instructional material. We also have to um, we also have other frequent corrections that need to be made, which are a changing and um, the selected options for the state adopted field, you'll need to look in EMAT, and if that item is in EMAT, then it should be yes for state adopted. If it's not something that can be found in EMAT, then it should be no for state adopted. Um, and we also uh, request many times um, for a district to add the shipping cost, um, not necessarily the shipping cost, but if they have a shipping request, they need to have a transaction ID that ties that back to the instructional material. If it's on the same request, it wouldn't necessarily have to have the transaction ID because it's showing you're showing us the material in the request. But if it you're requesting the shipping separately, then you need to put that transaction ID in the long description field so that we know what it ties back to. Okay, so um, from TEA's perspective, what information does TEA want our folks, our IM coordinators out there to put in the description placement in a disbursement? So that is a field that can hold many different things. It's for additional information. So some of the things that could be seen or used for the description field would be package information, such as uh, eight this package is for eight years print and eight years digital. Overage information, where you're telling us that you're using an overage, you're providing the transaction ID that the overage came from, and the amount of overage that you're using for this request. It can also be used for uh, quantities, for items with the same price. So if you have a K-5 math adoption and all of the materials are the same price, then you can lump them all together into one line and tell us in the description field uh, how many for each grade level that's going to be. Uh, you can also put information such as the number of novels or books or sheet music that a district's receiving. Um, if you're using the title of various titles, uh, this is very helpful if you're buying a large quantity of novels that you don't have to do a line for each novel. You can put the title as various titles and then tell us how many books you're receiving in that description field. Uh, one other example would be the actual lab equipment such as beakers and safety goggles when you would use science lab equipment as the title. You're just providing that additional information for us. Okay. Um, so how does one go about removing a person in the contact section in EMAT? So to remove a person on the contact section in EMAT, you just need to contact the Instructional Materials Division. You can either call us or email the Instructional Materials mailbox and we will remove that person's access and remove them. Um, as you can see, when you're in EMAT, you can only change 
um, the other fields such as the, ad, um, the email address and the phone number. Um, but we have to make that switch and we will also remove their T's access when we um, move, remove them from EMAT. So now, how do I create a new disbursement? How would I go about creating a new disbursement request if the next link uh, is not available? So if the next link is not available, then you'll need to look at your prerequisites to make sure those have all been uh, fulfilled. So looking at your start page in EMAT, you'll need to look and see if we've received your signed IME Antique Certification Form. If that's not been um, signed by your board, then you'll need to fill out the form in EMAT, take it to your board for signature, and then submit that to TEA. Also, you'll need to make sure your summer ship dates are updated. This link is only available during the summer to uh, let the publishers know when someone will be available to receive shipment. So it's important that you look at those dates, make sure that you provide at least three dates or date ranges that someone will be available to um, receive shipment for your district. And then you also need to update your contacts and addresses. It's a good idea um, to do this frequently so that if we need to get a hold of someone, we're able to contact the person in the contacts list and talk to them about a request. So I think we're possibly to our last question. Um, okay, so I'm an EMAT and uh, I've run into another problem. What do I do if the information below the bar graph is missing in EMAT? So if the information below the bar graph is missing in EMAT, you need to make sure that you have com confirmed your contacts and addresses. And once that's been done, you should see all of the information there. If you have other performance issues in EMAT, it'd be a good idea to clear your browser history and then uh, log out of EMAT and log back in. And if that doesn't work, then contact the Instructional Materials Division and we'll uh, work with our programmers to make sure we get any issues uh, corrected. Excellent. Well, uh, I think that's about it for us today. Thank you, Janet, so much for being here. We really appreciate TEA taking the time out uh, to record this video and be a part of all our summer institutes, uh, various locations across the state of Texas. Um, we do want to remind everyone that TEA will be live and in person at the IMCAT Annual Conference, which is, of course, November 11th through the 14th at the Moody Gardens Conference Center and Hotel in Galveston. Uh, hope to see you all there. Keep uh, checking your emails and the IMCAT website for registration info. Uh, but for now, once again, enjoy your summer. Enjoy the rest of your summer institute. Uh, and we hope to see you in the future at, a, at an IMCAT uh, event. I'm Clay Avery. Uh, thanks again for joining us.